Hey there, I'm Vladimir Lore, the friend who masquerades, bitching and moaning is a legit critique and analysis, and this is Master of Unlocking. So I decided to do Clock Tower next, but they're fairly short games, so I tackled the three that showed up on the PlayStation. First Fear, Clock Tower, and The Struggle Within. Now, I'm under no delusion that these are survival horror games. I'd call them more point-and-click horror. However, when you look it up, you'll see a lot of people refer to it as a survival horror point-and-click adventure game, which is just a fucking mouthful first, and second, mechanically doesn't even have an inkling of survival mechanics. There's no resources to manage, only puzzles, and something trying to kill you. So I'm going to start with the first fear. First. Fear. First. Fear. Fuck! Because it's the first game, and it'll give us a base to see how the series grows. But first, fear, stop. I'm going to go over some similarities of all the games, so I don't have to do it for each one. So these games were point-and-click adventures, which means that they use the cursor to basically control everything. But wait, aren't those games made for consoles? How does a mouse cursor feel with a controller? About how do you expect? A little clunky. The way these games supplement that clunk is by turning up the sensitivity so you'll lightning fast. Whoa, jeez, God! F and by putting magnets in the cursor so it clips into points of interest without fine-tuning. Now, you might be asking, aren't magnets bad for my screen? And the truth is, we just don't know enough about magnets to say. They also all have this obtuse point-and-click puzzle logic from time to time, but none of them are generally so bad that you need a walkthrough to beat them. Mostly because there's just so few options available to you that you can generally brute your force way through it. They also have a monster that pops in when they feel like it to chase you down. In the first two games, it's the infamous Skizzerman. However, in the evil within, I mean the struggle within, it's, oh hey look, it's I got a knife again. In all the games, there are weird not killer killers like this mirror, or this sword, or this doll, or this mask, or this we get it. These games all also have an autosave feature, so if you happen to die, don't worry. You can restart from the last room you were in. You'll just have to sit through the loading screens and whatnot. In the games made for the PSX, though, you can save whenever the fuck you want. It's a nice bonus, with the only unfortunate thing being that you can only get three slots. All of these games have multiple endings. Each one ups the ante, but most of the endings are pretty similar. Or jokes. Or just straight up dumb. You're crazy. So let's start with the first fear. First, fuck. So the first game is about a group of girls getting adopted by a 2B sugar daddy, living in a mansion in the middle of the woods. When they arrive, they get left in the main hall for like, ever. Until Jennifer decides to take a look around, and as soon as she leaves, shit goes down. From here, what happens is such a wild variety because of the game's divergent paths. Like, you could explore all the rooms and find this bitch in the shower. Or you could say, fuck that noise, skip it, find her in the armor. Or you could say, that ain't me, and get poisoned by the worst mom. Or you could say, I don't need your pity poison, and poison your damn self. Or you could just get in the car and say, bye bitches, I ain't dying the day. Like, holy shit, a single playthrough of this game is super short. But there are so many paths to take, it's unbelievable. But I suppose that's an affordance of the point-and-click adventure style. Uh, since the gameplay is a limited facet, you could spend far more resources on the content. Speaking of gameplay, it's pretty straightforward for the most part. Point, click, double tap to run, triple tap to confuse Jennifer and make her spin in circles. There's a panic button that no one ever tells you about, because this was a time before tutorials. So good luck figuring out which button you need to mash to save your life. Something odd, if Jennifer is walking, she will just keep on walking unless you tell her to stop with another separate button. What I didn't really expect when booting this game up was how open the map would be from the outset. Like, you basically get the whole east wing, but the west wing key is found in the very first explorable room, and there's no puzzle, it's just sitting there. So unless you really don't like exploring every available option, you'll generally have access to most of the map, the green and the yellow. With most puzzles and keys, they just get you into one room as opposed to opening it up an entire new section. Generally, I'd say this is boring level design, however, I think it works so well in the first fear because of the killer. When you start getting chased, having a lot of options on the fly to think, where do I need to go to get rid of this fucking thing, is better than only having small maze-like spaces to do so, the latter being more confining and not giving the player any real choice. Overall, the first fear is fantastic and the art still holds up the atmosphere of this point-and-click horror. It's an incredibly solid base, so let's see how well they handle it in the sequel. So Clock Tower is a direct sequel to The First Fear, 
and this is more prominent in the Japanese versions of these games, where the first fear is known as Clock Tower, and this one's Clock Tower 2. Jennifer is absolutely traumatized after seeing all of her friends die, and, uh, whatever this thing is. This game, from the out, already has way more characters than the first, and they spend time building up the world, letting you know the public has celebritized the Scissor Man as some sort of legend. This game starts in a long, drawn-out, safe area where you can speak with some of the future cast, and this decides who your main character gets to be. Jennifer from the first game, or her guardian, Helen. I got Helen my first try, which, map design-wise, is basically the same. Really, the biggest path to verge is if you give the demon statue to the old man or the library. I chose the old man Jenkins my first run. Upgrades from the first game. Voice acting. I can't say the voiceovers are quality, in fact, they're downright terrible. However, they are a monumental source of entertainment. I just love the delivery of this. Another neat thing they changed is instead of having the inventory be a button that locked you from the game, now it's just a part of the top screen. A little bit out of the way, but it's a lot less frustrating to handle. I suppose you could say the jump from 2D to 3D was an upgrade. I don't think it holds up as much atmospherically compared to the first fear, but it's not terrible either. What's really weird is the way they handled the shadows. Most games of this era just did the shadow sprite below the character. Even the struggle within defaults to it. So I don't really know why the first fear was all like, what if we built a whole rig out of blocks? Oh well. It's interesting, but not really helping with the age. As mentioned prior, being able to save whenever is a nice touch. While the game does save for you in every room, the self-saves are a good way to feel certain your data will still be there upon return, and you can even save before big choices so you don't have to go back through the whole game and retry certain scenes. Again, however, only having three slots is ass. The location variety is nice. However, only the final area, the castle, has any sort of complexity. But I think that's funny, as the game is at its best when it has open level design, where it's less about trying to solve puzzles to unlock doors and more about the exploration of and avoiding the killer. Since that's what makes a clock tower game stand out from other point and click adventure games. A stalker which splits these games into exploration and puzzles to run and hide. The first couple areas are small and allow you to reuse hiding spots, but the castle is not as kind. So the last part I was running around the entire castle trying to find context sensitive objects to get the hunchback to stop fucking following me. It was the worst part of the game. Cause when you're being chased, you have no options but to deal with it. And since there's one killer and it only has one method of chasing you, Skizzerman actively becomes an annoyance as opposed to a terror. This game did legit startle me though. Since it has no adherence to reality, the little fucker can pop up anywhere at any given time at all. And I honestly didn't expect him at this moment. It had my heart racing, as well as my mind trying to think of where I could go hide. As I hadn't explored basically at all at this point, I just had to run and figure it out. And I also didn't know at this point if I could reuse old spots. So the long short of it is, Clock Tower on the PlayStation is very good. While it too is short, like the first one, it finds most of its content in replayability. Okay, so... What happened? We had two great games behind us, and then this one just shits the bed. So in the first two games, you get a large area to explore, and everything is open, and a lot of the fun is wandering around looking at things. This game cuts all that shit out. There are doors the game will refuse to even let you look at until it's ready for you to use them. Most rooms only have like one or two points of interest to even interact with, but the game doesn't make it clear you need to check those things multiple times in order to get all of the dialogue. Now, to be fair, this was a slight problem that Clock Tower had, where it just wouldn't run through all of the dialogue in a cutscene, and it wanted to make sure you were still playing. So it'd make you click on a person several times, but that was in cutscenes where you had no options and you could only go forward in the dialogue. Here, it's for like every item. You cannot progress until you've seen all the dialogue on certain items. But since the game doesn't make that explicitly clear ever, fucking you'll look at an item and be like, cool. And then you'll walk away. And then you'll come back later because you have nothing else to look at and you'll look at it again. It's like, oh look, there's new dialogue. It's well, that's dumb. Arm? And then you'll go away. And then, oh hey look, a door's open now. I'm gonna go look in there. 
Then the game tries to teach you that you can't see in the dark. You as a player can, but Alyssa slash Bates refuses to look at anything if the lights aren't on. And this tidbit of info will most likely be something you find out through pure frustration. Since the light switches are next to doors, you'll probably just assume you clicked on the door, only to find that, oh hey, the lights were off? This game is so frustrating that I really just wanted to give up there, and the rest of the game is basically the same. Where the game has one path to take, and it needs you to take it. But since there isn't any guidance, you just wander the same rooms over and over and over, hoping to figure out what the hell you need to do. And this gets even worse when they introduce the split personality mechanic. Essentially, you play as a girl named Alyssa, and she has a second personality, Bates. Alyssa is a punk-ass bitch, has no combat skills, really cutting down your options when it comes to getting away from the monster. Bates ain't having none of it though. You can find a gun in this game, and you could use it to shoot the little gremlin, get her off your trail. Unfortunately, you can't just switch willy-nilly. The game is super particular about it, so Alyssa has a medallion that keeps Bates at bay. In order to get Bates, you need to find a spot to put the amulet down. Luckily, there are plenty of places to do this, but strike off your grade, because it's just not that simple. Once the amulet is down, Alyssa has to panic, which will make you leave the room. Then you have to get away from the door so the monster will enter the room, aim, fire, leave the room, go find the amulet. Because you find somebody to talk to, you can't talk to them as Bates. I mean, you can, but he's a dick about it, and you'll get a bad ending for it. So you pick up the amulet, you put it back down. I think this game would have benefited from a Franbo pills mechanic instead, where the player can choose at will what they are to solve puzzles. While the house is small, it's annoying to have to backtrack every time something happens. However, what's even more annoying is that the player is forced to leave the room if they're attacked. So one time I needed to get down the stairs, but I was in the bathroom. And every time I came out, the little bitch was standing there waiting. So I had to run around this whole side area. Again, not a lot of time, but moving around in this game is sluggish and takes for fucking ever. And so it feels like an ordeal. This whole game is an ordeal. Like, here's what the map should look like. But here's more closely how it ends up feeling because of all the forced arbitration. I really can't even recommend this one because it almost feels like a downgrade. And the story is... Bleh. I, I don't know, but I only got so far into it, and I hear the story basically takes a 180 degree turn from where I was. Where it starts off as about something supernatural and moves over to zombies, because that was what was popular at the time. So this episode is weird, because this series was about what makes survival horror, and this one isn't by any means. They're all horror for sure, but outside the misconception that the survival part is about not dying, these games just don't have any survival elements. Just exploration, monsters, puzzles, and atmosphere. But the monsters and atmosphere are more of the horror aspect, and the exploration isn't a puzzle in of itself. The map isn't a dungeon. It's just a space for the horror to take place. Now, I'd highly recommend The First Fear and Clock Tower, as they're very much like 80s slasher films. It's really a shame that this style of game has an even smaller pool than survival horror does, because when it's done right, it's great. And so while this is kind of a departure, there's a game recently released that's called Remothered, and I want to look at it, because the tagline of this game is THE REAL ESSENCE OF SURVIVAL HORROR. Is it though? I have a strong feeling it'll be more like these Clock Tower games than Resident Evil. I expect at best Remothered will be like Clock Tower, what Resident Evil 7 was to the old Resident Evil games. So we're going to test it. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to indulge me. I really do appreciate it. Go ahead and tell me your thoughts on Clock Tower and what you think survival horror is. Follow me on Twitter for updates on future videos and games I'm working on, and I'll see you next time. Until then, stay creative.